Okay, Rabotai, um, <clears throat> ready to start uh, our Gemara on Daf Nun Omed Aleph 50a, um, right towards the end of the Perik, and we should even be able to start the next Perik, Hecholil, today. So we will be uh, finishing this Perik in, uh, in a short while, but we're still carrying on a theme um, that had started quite a while ago. Uh, today's share will be, again, quite technical, but there'll be lots of very interesting twists in it. So I hope you'll enjoy the technicality, but do try to stay, stay awake. I'm assuming you will have strong coffee with you this time of the morning. No excuse to fall asleep. There's a lot of detail involved, although it's interesting detail. So let me take you back before we go forward. Let me take you back into the theme, because we can only go forward when we um, reach the right place in our background knowledge. We talked about the ceremony of Nisso Hamayim, of the libation of the water and also of wine on the roof of the Mizbech. Now the Nisso Hamayim took place all the days of Sukkot, so it took place for, for seven days. And uh, each day, if you remember the ceremony, and I have to repeat it again because the details are important, Water was drawn from the, um, the pool at the uh, King David's uh, city, as the city of David is it today, the Shuluach, and it was taken up with a great throng and ceremony and music and rejoicing up the hill to the Har Habayis, to the Beis Hamikdash. And in the Beis Hamikdash, the um, uh, water would be taken further. Uh, to the top of the Mizbeach, the roof of the Mizbeach, and it would be poured into a flask. And that flask would be embedded in the Mizbeach, and then that water and also wine would drain through a hole or a pipe system down to the base of the Mizbeach. But that was the libation ceremony, and it was done with great simcha, with accompanying music, as we'll see in the next Peyrek. The next Peyrek, we're going to be discussing the musical instruments that we use to accompany this whole ceremony. There was a difference though, the Mishnah told us many weeks ago, uh, between the way in which the um, libation ceremony took place, if it was on a weekday, to how it was done on a Shabbat. On a Shabbat, there was a difference. And the problem was this, during the week, each day, the water would be taken up from the Shluach pool uh, and directly to the uh, top of the Mizbeach and the libation ceremony would follow. But on a Shabbat, it was not permitted to carry the water from the Shiluach pool into the city and onto the Mizbeach. So the water had to be prepared on the Friday, Erev Shabbos. And it was then left in the um, uh, base on the floor of the Azara, the uh, Beis Hamikdash overnight to be used in the Shabbat libation ceremony. So the Mishnah told us something, which was a technical detail. And that was that whereas on all the other days of the week, the water that was drawn from the Shiluach pool was drawn and placed into a container that was sanctified, Mikudeshes, something that was already, if you like, an official sanctified vessel of the Beis Amikdosh, but that's the way you would normally take uh, contents up to the Beis Amikdosh in a sanctified vessel, not, not in something you just got from your own home. On Friday, it was different. They deliberately took the water up in a non-sanctified vessel. Um, and, and then they placed that in the base on Mikdosh, and then they transferred it on the next morning to the vessel embedded in the Mizbeah. Why did they do it that way? Because there's a particular halacha which states that um, anything that goes into a keli mikudeshes, into a sanctified vessel, if that becomes the Kudush itself, the, the contents, the water becomes, if you like, sanctified. And water that is sanctified cannot be kept overnight. If it is kept overnight, it is desanctified by virtue of it having stayed overnight. Lina makes it pasul. There are many aspects of the Beis Amitra ceremony in which the contents or the meat would have specific time frames in which they could be used. So water that was already sanctified from the Friday on over Friday night could not be used the next morning anymore in the libation ceremony, it would be pasul. 
So therefore they took it up in a non-sanctified vessel on Friday afternoon, Friday morning, and left it in the base I mentioned. Now that's fine, because if it's brought up in a non-sanctified vessel, then the water itself does not become sanctified and can remain as long as possible. So you have this irony that if you like the, uh, the expiry date or something sanctified, it's very quick, it's overnight. And if you're gonna use it the next day, you can't do so. However, a non-sanctified water, uh, because it's been taken up in a non-sanctified vessel, has no such restrictions. And therefore, the uh, water that was meant to be used for a Shabbat would be taken up on the Friday in a non-sanctified vessel to avoid this problem that it would become possible. So that's really where we reached last time. We went through some of those details. It's just something you need to keep in mind because it will play a role in understanding the next piece of Gemara. So I'm going to take you now to Daf Nun Omadal. If you, if you have the sheet or your own Gemara, we're going to start one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines from the top. Uh, and the first word on the line, very conveniently, Nishbacha. And this is a quote from the Mishnah, which the Gemara is now going to analyze, Nishbacha o Nisgalsa. The Mishnah, several weeks ago, went on to say something else. It went on to say that if on a Shabbat, having um, received the water on the Friday and it was in the courtyard, you now wish to use that water and, and transfer it into the Kli on top of the Mizbeach, which was the libation ceremony, if you looked at this uh, vessel, which was now on the floor of the, of the Beis Hamikdash, and you found that it had been accidentally spilt, or parts of the contents weren't there anymore, someone had carelessly kicked it overnight, and some of the water liquid was missing. Now, according to one opinion, if that happens, you don't have a requisite to look of water anymore. Yes, you are missing some of the water. Uh, some of the Shiluach pool water had been uh, evicted from the Kli um, mistakenly. Or if it had been left for a period overnight or even in early in the morning, uncovered. We will see what this means as well. In other words, there was no lid or covering on the top of the Kli. That's also going to be a problem, even if nothing was spilt. It needs to be covered if it's on the floor of the Mizbeach, and we'll see why, on the floor of the Beis Amikdosh. Under those circumstances, if one, of the, one or any, either of these two misdemeanors had taken place, either some of the water contents you found on a Shabbat morning had been spilt, or you found that it had been left uncovered, in either of those two situations, the Mishnah went on to say, you cannot use that water now for the libation. And what are you going to do? You can't go back to the Shluach pool at the Shabbat morning because the whole point is you can't take any more money or water on, and drag it up the hill on a Shabbat. You can do that on a weekday if this had happened, but not on a Shabbat. So what are you going to use now for the Shabbat libation? So under these circumstances, the Mishnah said you have an option B. And that option B is to use the water from the Kior. The Kior is the laver, L-A-B-E-R, or the wash basin. Um, that was, was a beautifully ornate wash basin in the second base Amikdash times. I mean, it had been constructed uh, to, um, to the higher standards, um, and it had all these little taps at the bottom, and the Kohanim would use this uh, wash basin every morning before they started their avod. It was the first thing almost that they did, and they washed their hands and their feet before they could start the Alvoda. So that, this was the official labor. It was in the base Hamikdash and contained a huge volume of water. And you could use that water, the, um, the Mishnah told us, as a substitute for the water which had spilled or had been left exposed and therefore was unusable. You could use the Kior water. It's not Lechat Chila, we rather not, but in the situation where you have no other alternative, you can use the Kior water. And that will be all right. And you can take from the kill water and transfer it into that flask on top of this beach, and the libation ceremony uh, can proceed. That's what the Mishnah told us. Um, <clears throat> so let me just go back and, and explain what is the problem. What's the problem? So we said as far as using the water that had been spilt, if it was spilt water, then I said the problem was that you didn't have the necessary volume. 
And that's therefore obvious that you spilt the contents that you need to find a new source of water for libation and you can use a cure water. But what about this uncovering thing? So what if it's uncovered? So here, um, there are, there, the problem is this, that at those days, and we find this in a number of places, Chazal, water or food, particularly water that was left uncovered, was considered to be not fit to be drunk even. And I'm not even talking about using it for libation because there was a chashash, there was a fear that a snake may have deposited its venom while you weren't looking into the liquid. And therefore, if you drank it, you might die because you've swallowed venom. Now that was the original um, gezera against using water that was uncovered. So this was a health hazard. There is another problem, which they say here as well, but according to the view that there has to be a precise volume of water in the, um, in the jug, the two log for libation ceremony, if a, think about it, a snake has deposited its venom into the water because the, the, the jug was uncovered, then there would be an excess of liquid there now. A pretty horrible thing to think about. There'll be two log plus a few milliliters of venom. Now that's already in excess of the two log. So that's according to one opinion, but let's not spend too much time on that. The major view is that it's because this water is now contaminated. It's not water anymore, which you can even drink, and therefore you shouldn't be able to use it as libation. So that's the problem with, un, um, with, 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 with um, uncovered Kaylee that contained that water. If it was left exposed, that there might be some uh, snake venom in it, and that would make the water possible for use. Under those circumstances, um, even if you don't see snake venom, the fact that it was uncovered and there is a possibility that it's been contaminated by venom means that you have to pour those contents out and you can take from the kiosk the wash basin instead. Now, actually, uh, if you think about it, and maybe you haven't thought about it, there's a problem over here as well. How can you use the water from the kior? The kior itself is a sanctified instrument. It's, a, it's in the floor of a base hamikdash, and it has been sanctified. The water itself is sanctified. It's all part of a, uh, uh, a um, liquid that's going to be used to wash the feet of the kohanim. So it's sanctified water. So if it's sanctified water, hasn't that also been left overnight in the base I made? Gosh, are they really drawing new water again the next morning? On Friday, maybe, that wash basin was filled. It was filled for the use of washing the Kohanim's feet even the next day on Shabbat. Overnight, therefore, it's been hanging around in a sanctified vessel. So why is that any better than using a sanctified vessel on a Shabbat morning from the Shaluach pool, or, or, or on Friday, filling it on Friday in a sanctified vessel. We said the problem was that if it's left overnight, it becomes possible for usage and libation. But what about the water in the uh, wash basin? Surely that's also, if you like, puzzle melina from the same reason and shouldn't be usable for the libation. And it is sanctified water as well. So how can you use that? So under, to understand that, I want to introduce you to a, a, a neat little trick. The uh, base Amitras is well aware of the fact that um, sanctified water becomes pasol overnight. And yet they had a kiwa, which was filled with huge amounts of water. And um, it was going to be used the next morning. And therefore, they had a trick to prevent, um, um, if you like, uh, the pasol of staying overnight for the water in that large wash basin. And over here, let me share screens with you. You're very, very fortunate that I actually have this picture. Well, if I can find the share screen device, here we are. Okay, there's a lot to see over here in this picture. I'm sharing screen. Um, and look at the right hand um, image first. That's the cure. And it has this thing it says on the top, Muhani. I'm not sure I really understand why it says Muhani on top, but never mind. I think it's because it's part of some other mechanism. Um, but this is the cure, basically. Here you can see the taps. Yes, it looks like one of those. It looks like one of those wine fountains you might use to make kiddush nowadays. Except if you look at the scale over here, you can see that this is maybe six feet high. A magnificent uh, spectacle here, made of copper or whatever it was made of. 
and the water filled it and they used to wash their hands, even see Quran in washing their hands and feet. And I said to you that this has a problem as well because it's filled with water, it's kept overnight, which means by the next morning, surely the water is pustle. And how can you use it for libation? So what is here the commissioner recommending that if, um, if it's spilt or it was exposed that you could use the water from the cure? Doesn't the cure have the same problem? The answer is, is it doesn't. You know why? Let's have a look at the left-hand image over here. The Gomorrah tells us of a pre-industrial revolution device that was in the base Hamidosh, which was used to ensure that overnight the water from the cure would not become Pasul Melina. And it worked like this. First of all, look at the cure in place here, right? That's the cure. Over here, what do you see? A pit. What's this pit? It's a water bore. It's a bore mine, which means that below the surface, there is a pool of water. And that pool of water may well have been like a mikvah type water. It wasn't drawn water, it was water in the bottom. Now, normally they could draw water from here and put it into the cure. But what did they do overnight to prevent uh, with this problem of Lina? They did something very remarkable. Can you see what's on top here of this image? A pulley system. This was called a muhani. Now you understand the word muhani, the mechona is a car. Yeah, mechonit is a car, mechona is an engine or a motor or something. Muhani means a mechanical engine device. And they had this in the base of Mikdashani. Now what do they do with it? It has chains or ropes that link to the top of the kiosk. That's this thing over here as well on the, uh, on the right hand image. And they used to hoist it up. And therefore, each evening before they finished the services, they would hoist this whole cure up, which weighed a ton, presumably. And it had water in it. And they would lower it through the bar. And when they lowered it through the bar, the water within the cure is in contact. If you like, it's, it kisses the shika, it kisses the water within the bar. By that device, it is as if the water in the cure is um, attached to the water in the bore, and therefore the water in the cure isn't considered to be in the cure container anymore, but rather in the pit. It's not going to become pasolina. It's not going to consider considered kali water anymore. Actually, the principle involved here is similar to that of a of a mikvah, where you have some clean water, shall we say, well, not 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 a kali mikvah, which is always revolting, um, but a mikvah which is look, well looked after, where there is a a meeting between the water which you go into and some rainwater at some point where there is a they call it a kissing of the two types of water. Over here, you have a kissing between the water in the cure automatically through various funnels with the water in the bar. And it's left there overnight. When it's lifted up in the morning, you can use it. If you'd left this cure on the ground, it would have been pasolina. But by the fact that you lowered it into the bar and it became at one with a mikvah shalmayim, uh, it is not considered to have been overnight in the cure and therefore can be used the next morning. Okay, that was a long story all to justify the fact that the water in the kiyot does not have the same soul. It's not considered to become possible overnight because of this strange trick of throwing the, um, or oh, shall we say, lowering the cure into this bore mine, um, which prevented this problem of solina. So therefore now we understand. Uh, we understand that the, um, uh, when you find on a Shabbat morning that the contents that you draw drawn from the shliot pool on Friday had spilt, or, that those contents were left exposed so that there's a risk of snake venom contaminating them. You get rid of that water you took from the Shuach pool on the Friday. You instead replace it from water taken from those taps from the Kior, and that is used for libation. Now, that basically takes us to those two words, really. Sometimes there's a lot of, there's a lot of explanation. In Mishnah and Iskalsa, that Mishnah said that if, any, if it had poured out or become uh, exposed uh, without a cover, um, then you may use the water libation, uh, the water from the cure as, uh, as libation, as an alternative. So now let's go further into the Gomorrah. That, that sort of has explained um, the reason the Mishnah gives us that you can use the cure. But now the Gomorrah asks Akasha, 
The Gemara asks the Kasha, why is it necessary to have to resort to the Kiva? This is after those two dots, the last two words on the next Levamai, Le'avir. The Gemara asks a question, which is very much one that uh, you know, a person living at home you know, with a full range of cooking utensils would now ask. Vamai, why is it nece necessary to, to use this alternate form of pure water? Why can't we still use the water that came out of the previous day from the Shlirach pool? Even though you now suspect in the case, not where it was spilt, but where it might have been exposed during this period, and you're concerned about snake venom. So what, says the Gemara, le'avir b'misanenes. Why do we not pass it through a strainer? There you are, simple housewife solution to a problem like this, assuming that a strainer will strain out the venom because it has a different um, specific gravity to the water, and uh, you'll be left with the uh, venom in the strainer, and uh, what comes through is fine. The Gomorrah is suggesting let's use the strainer, this Misanelis. Interesting, Rashi over here, Rashi always goes into detail on devices, uh, devices that he was aware of, which he felt were similar to the devices being described, described in, the, uh, in, in the Mishnah or in the Gomorrah. And he says, but here, so to speak, in France, they have uh, instruments called couleurs, um, which are strainer devices, where you have a strainer, you know, which has holes in it, which is, um, if you like, the top vessel underneath it is a pot, so that you can strain liquid through the holes of the pores of the top strainer, and it directly feeds into a pot underneath. It's resting on a pot. He calls that um, couleur. Uh, at Missanenis, and he says that storekeepers in France used to have this for a particular purpose, and everyone knew what they were. And what was the purpose? So you learn a little bit about French cookery. In France at the time, they liked spiced wine, not just wine, but wine which had a, a, a real tang of spices. So how do you make spiced wine? So he says that you put some spices, you know, which would be powder or twigs of spices or whatever it is, into the strainer on top. And then you pass wine through it. And as it gradually filters through the wine, it will keep the, the taste and the smell of the spice um, and will drain below. And you've got your spiced wine. And he says, this is widespread. So this is the device he suggests we're being um, refer, referred to over here as a misanenes. You simply therefore should be able to pass the water which even if you don't, if, whether you know or you don't know for sure it has venom in, but even if it has venom, if you did so, any venom will get stuck in the strainer on top. So why don't we use that? So the Gemara, so, so Gemara wants to infer from this by the fact that our Mishnah did not suggest using the strainer, that there must be a problem with using the strainer. So let's go on. Lema masni sin. Should we say that the Mishnah, which says you cannot use the strainer, you've got to use the new water from the Kior, perhaps it, it, this proves that the Tanra of that Mishnah does not hold of the opinion of Rabbi Nehemia. Because we're going to see in a moment that Rabbi Nehemia, under certain circumstances, believes that a strainer will effectively strain out the um, uh, snake venom. And since the Mishnah does not suggest you use the strained contents from the Shluach pool, it clearly does not hold of his opinion that you may use a strainer. So let's go a little bit further and see if we're going to quote a Mishnah uh, uh, which um, uh, is being referred to over actually a Bryce, the Tanya. It was taught in a Bryce, and here we'll see Rabbi Nehemia, we will see there's a Machloket. One of the signs of the Machlokas will be Rabbi Nechenia, who is the permissive. But the first opinion in the Brisa here is prohibitive. But let's, so let's do this in order. The Tanya was taught in a Brisa, Misanenes, if you use a strainer, as we've decided, Yeshbo Mishum Giloy, it is still considered technically that the um, water that has drained through, or wine, or whatever it is, 
was exposed. In other words, the use of a strainer does not help in eliminating snake venom. The context over here actually is not really for the libations. Let's, let, we're getting here into a discussion of what you should be allowed to eat. There are certain things that are, are considered to be asur, or shall we say almost, you might use the word treif, not because they're pig meat or anything else, but simply because they're a danger. You know there's a, a takana that we don't eat fish uh, followed by meat straight away, because originally Chazal said there was a form of sakana. We don't really know what form of sakana, so therefore you drink something, you put some challah in your mouth, you wait a few minutes, whatever it is. Um, if you're following um, fish with meat. Well, there's no trafus here. However, there is such an understanding and, and, and a lot of people, many people are very makpid that if something has a problem of safety, health, hygiene, then it's a very high level kashrus problem. It's a very high level kashrus problem. So here too, it used to be the case that if you had water uncovered, particularly if you left it overnight and so you really don't know what's been going on, you're observing the clean, and there was water there, there was a risk that a snake would have wriggled along and deposited venom inside. So therefore, there would have been a prohibition, not just advice, not just a health advice, you know, like you find on a cigarette pack, but a halachic prohibition against a person drinking that water. You'd have to spill it out. Not even if you have no reason to believe there was a snake there, but simply because it was a possibility. Now, having said that, um, the post can say the Bisman has there, particularly where in our countries, and I have to say in our countries, was originally in Europe, probably more than in Israel, we don't really have to worry about it anymore because we don't have snakes wriggling around. And you might say that even in our houses, you know, they're fairly well secured, we have doors, we have floors. Uh, there's hygiene, there isn't stuff around for them to attract the snakes so much. So I'm not sure, I guess if you were still very mudpied, you wouldn't want to drink uncovered water, even if it wasn't snakes for other reasons. But this was considered a high priority to ensure your water flasks were covered over uh, if they were unattended. So, the, and he goes as far as saying, the Tanakama, the first view over here, that even if you were to use a strain, a straining mechanism. You were to pass the water through a strainer and uh, so that it gradually filtered below. And then you didn't drink the water until it had gone through the straining process. It would still be forbidden. Well, that seems a bit far-fetched. Well, does it? Let's do Rabbi Nehemia first and see which one is far-fetched. So the, the next opinion is not so fast. A strainer can work. Because the Rabbi Nehemiah now says, um, Rabbi Nehemiah, a Masai, when do I hold, says Rabbi Nehemiah, that there is a problem even using the strainer, but it's still considered to be megula uh, as if it were exposed, even though you've sent it through this reparative me mechanism, but it doesn't help. When might that be the case? And here, this next piece is highly confusing. I find myself in a bit of trouble. I'm pleased to notice that, note that no one explains this properly because I think everyone's in the same sort of trouble. So let's try and do this in a uh, reasonably um, overview fashion. That's only when is there a problem when the lower vessel in which the, the water would drain into after being strained remains uncovered. However, aval this mancha tartona mechusa, but if the lower kli, the lower keli, that is the one it drains into, is covered, afapisha ha'eliona megula, even though the strainer itself is not covered, ein ba mishim gilui. We don't hold that there's any risk here of the snake. Why? We'll just go on and then we'll try and paint the picture. Mipneisha eres nochash domer this fog, soft foam had been como. Because I believe that even if a snake were to discharge its venom into the top cle, which is the strainer, then that venom would just float on top and would not pass through to the lower vessel. In any case, uh, the, the first part I find a bit strange because how, why would you ever cover the lower vessel if you were trying to strain liquid through? It would stop the straining anyway. I failed to see uh, the picture too clearly. However, the point is, the Rebbe Nechemda is more permissive. 
Rebbe Hamia doesn't take an all out blanket prohibition of using water that has passed through a strainer mechanism. He says, that, uh, he says that as long as there is a strainer on top of the vessel underneath, it doesn't really matter because the strainer itself will catch any venom. Ha um, however, there has to be something, he says, that stops the snake wriggling between the strainer and the vessel underneath. That's the way I understand. It could still struggle its wiggle in between. But if it can't wiggle in between, and the only place it could be positive venom is on the top of the strainer, then that strainer would prevent the venom coming through. That's Rabbi Nehemia. In other words, Rabbi Nehemia, they're just taken simply, holds that a strainer could work in blocking the transmission of snake venom to the liquid underneath. However, the first opinion in the, in the Brysa said you can't use a strainer at all. Why would he hold of that opinion? It seems that according to the first opinion, he simply holds, and this is something that you need to look at, um, I think, um, biologically or whatever, that snake venom may be able to penetrate a strainer. Now you could say, well, how thick and how wide are the holes? You know, what kind of snake venom? And indeed, the uh, commentaries talk about it, saying that there might be, it depends upon the snake. I mean, I haven't actually compared a rattlesnake with a boa constrictor or anything else, I don't know, whichever, different types of poisonous snakes, their venom will be different. Now their venom tends to be quite viscous. So you can understand the idea that, you know, shall we say you can picture the idea of the venom being caught by the strainer. But the first opinion the Bryce says is you can't rely on it. It could be that certain types of venom will penetrate through and will actually find their way into the container underneath. And therefore the straining process will not have been effective. So the Gemara wants to say, well, very interesting uh, uh, law, real rules we're learning here about snake venom, um, that um, our Mishnah, uh, which spoke about using the Kiora water as a substitute for the water that had been left uncovered um, in the base Hamikdash, because we're worried about uh, a snake having deposited venom in that water, um, must be according to the first opinion of Tanakama, which is very, very restrictive, prohibitive on straining. And therefore, that's why it doesn't suggest or propose that you merely strain the water and then everything you can use the original water after straining. Because if it had been according to the opinion of Rabbi Nehemia, then you would have been able to use the original water from the Shaluach pool after straining. The fact that the mission does not suggest that, suggests that it holds that straining is ineffective, and that is not according to the view of Rabbi Nehemia. Is that all clear now? So this can't go like Rabbi Nehemia. Rabbi Nehemia is permissive of straining devices. And, uh, and therefore, our Mishnah, which suggests that straining the water doesn't help, cannot go according to Rabbi Nehemia. Okay, so let's go on in the Gemara. Uh, the, the Gemara is going to, um, the Gemara is going to uh, doubt the, this, this latest uh, comment that the, um, it cannot go according to Rabbi Nehemia. Maybe it even goes according to Rabbi Nehemia. It's dismissing this. But we've just said they can't go to Rabbi Nehemia because Rabbi Nehemia is quite permissive. So why don't you allow to use it strained? Just strain it according to Rabbi Nehemia. The Gemara says, no, you know what? This could even be according to the view of Rabbi Nehemia. But there's a reason nevertheless that he insists you don't use strained water, even if it's effective, even if it's effective. Rather, you should use the water from the cure. And let's see why. We might even say that it is the, according to the view of Rabbi Nehemiah. In what circumstances does Rabbi Nehemiah permit using strained water and is not concerned about the penetration of the snake venom? Where we're talking about ordinary people, whether they can drink or not drink. Is it dangerous? Is it not dangerous? Under those circumstances, um, Rabbi Nehemia would say, um, I believe that a strainer is effective. And since it's an effective, you can drink it. If it's, if it's you know, me or you drinking it, it's not such a big deal. He obviously must hold very strongly that, it, that it's effective because if there's a slightest risk, he wouldn't say so. But he's very, very certain that straining will keep out this 
uh, snake venom, and therefore a person's allowed to drink it if it's strained. That's fine. But our mission is not talking about person drinking the liquid. It's a completely different context. Other ligavoa, when it comes to um, a ceremony which is dedicated ligavoa to the one on high, in other words, the Nisuchamayim is a temple ceremony, which, if you like, is a ceremony directed towards a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Mioma, do you really think necessary, Rabbi Nechem, you would hold the same, since straining works to filter out the, ceremony, the, the, the venom and a person's allowed to eat it, do you think it necessarily shows that he would allow water so strained to be used on the Mizbeach? Isn't the Mizbeach and the uh, dedication of Kodesh Baruch Hu a higher form of ceremony than a person eating themselves? Interesting, isn't it? In other words, shouldn't we be more particular about the Mizbeach libation than a human libation. Now you might think the, the other way around, but if a person's going to drink it, I just die. Hashem's not going to die if you put some uh, if you put some snake venom into the water. But over here, the Gemara is going to take the opposite view. That when it comes to a person drinking it, we can be certain anyway, we can be certain that the straining works. And we're not so disgusted by using strained water. So we'll drink the strained water. Maybe you wouldn't, but uh, someone in that time in those times where water was rare would drink. But when it comes to libation to Hashem, should we really use strained, uh, uh, strained water that may have had specks of, um, of, of snake venom in it? Isn't that rather disgusting way to be um, uh, progressing with a ceremony, a ritual towards our Kaddish Baruch Hu? Don't you want to use something much, much, much purer because this is a service to Hashem? And, and, and you know, Hashem, so to speak, would like the best not the worst for us, not not Bediyevet, but Lachatchila. And we prove it from a posik. It's very nice. He brings this posik from a Lachi. It's a beautiful posik. The posik says, and we're just quoting over here, the less Leila Rebbe Nechemia, would Rabbi Nechemia not read this next posik? And I'll share this posik with you in a moment. What is the posik? It says, Hakrivehu no levechatsucha, hayitsucha, awayisa ponecha, ama Hashem tzvokos. So let me share my screen with you, one second, bring you this beautiful verse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Malachi 1.8, lovely possum. V'chi sagishun iver, the last of the Nevi'im. The iver is bach ein ro. This, everything has to be said here by the form of a question, it's not a statement. If you want to have a look at the translation, over here, when you present a blind animal for sacrifice, it doesn't matter. This shouldn't have an exclamation mark, really. It should have a question mark and an exclamation. Do you really think that when you, when you um, set up a carbon and the animal has a mum, a blemish, that I don't mind? When you present a lame or sick one, it doesn't matter? Yeah, one with a broken leg or one that's on its way out. You got it very cheaply because the animal dealer had no one else to give it to. You put it up in the Mizbeah, Hashem won't notice. Do you think that's fine? So the Milachi says, just offer it to your governor. Interesting. This is the way he translates it. Hakrivehu no lefe chosacha. The chosacha is an expression for your governor. Pachas was like a governor. If you were to give your governor a lame animal as a gift, do you think he wouldn't complain? Oh, Yisa Ponecha, will he accept you if you do such a thing? Will he show you favor? Said the Lord of hosts. Oh, here, it's interesting. We have a lot of the time you find the Nevi'im are raging against the people, spending their money on Karbonus as if to bribe Hashem, but not um, uh, behaving in a proper fashion, Ben Adam Lachavero. In other words, you know, they defraud people, they cheat people, they torture people, but they think they can offer up a korban and all is well. That's the classic korban statement you find in many of in Yeshayahu uh, and in the other prophets. Over here, Malachi's got a slightly different twist on it. He says, even those of you who are offering korbanas, when you offer those korbanas, you offer ones that you, you think you can get away with um, bending the rules, because after all, Hashem's not going to complain if the animal's blind. He's not going to send down a note and send, you know, provide another one. So on the cheap, 
You want to get away with offering up carbonus. Is that right? If you're going to offer up carbonus to me, then do so in the best possible way. And therefore, don't try and get away with a blind animal or a lame or sick animal. You would never be able to get away with it to your boss at work, and you can't get away with it to me. That's what um, Malachi is saying. And by the way, there's a similarity over here when we were talking about Cain and Hevel. You know, Cain kills Hevel. And the people ask, you know, why did was Hevel's sacrifice accepted, not Cain? And so they all want to say that um, Hevel offered from the best of his, whereas Cain just took something. He wasn't so interested in offering the best. So you see, even in Corbonus, you have this issue that if a person is putting their heart into offering a carbon, then they have to put their heart in it. You have to be even more careful not to try and shortchange. If you short, you can shortchange a person sometimes and get away with it, and there might even be mochel you. You try to shortchange a Kurdish Baruch, that's not right. So why do we bring this verse? Very beautifully, he's saying over here, <clears throat> he's saying over here, if you look at the Possek, that Possek said, you wouldn't get away with shortchanging your governor with a, uh, a, a, a bad animal. So Kalvachoma, how much more so would you not get away with shortchanging me, Akadosh Baruch you think I don't know? I'm above your governor. So what do you see over here? Interesting. You see that when it comes to ceremonials towards Akadosh Baruch Hu, we have to be even more careful that it's done in the most pure fashion than we would be if we were offering something similar to a person. So the Gemara suggests it's possible that Rabbi Nehemiah may well um, permit the use of a uh, strainer to strain out water of any potential snake venom and then to use that to drink because that's for you personally. However, do you think that it would be right and proper to use this sort of water um, to libate to Akadosh Baruch Hu? If you've got good water on the side end, which you can take from the Kior, which is no doubt of any snake venom, you're going to use it directly, use that. Otherwise, you're, use, you're shortchanging Hashem, even though, in other words, it may be permitted halachically. Something may even be permitted halachically, but it's, it's, it's budyevet. It's not certainly not... Uh, hid or mitzvah. It isn't beautifying the mitzvah to do so in the cheapest uh, or the most um, tricky way. And you may use the strainer under certain circumstances, but not for the purposes of worshipping our Kaddish Baruch. That's what the Gemara is. That's what the Gemara is being over. In other words, um, our Mishnah may go according to everyone. The Mishnah says you should use keel water. It may even be according to Rabbi Nehemiah, who is permissive when it comes to straining, but he's only permissive when it comes to straining for personal use not when it comes to you to using straining for divine use. For divine use, you shouldn't do that at all. The alternative is the cure water. You can use the cure water and you get away with it and that's done in the best possible way. And that's what I Mishnah recommended. Hadaran Allah Lula Varova, Hadaran Allah Lula Varova, Hadaran Allah Lula Lula Varova. So we've come to the end of this Peyrek. It's very interesting. A large part of this Peyrek was not really the Arova or the Lulav, it was the Niso Chamaim. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the parrot takes the name of the content right at the beginning. And sometimes the most of the parrot is actually in relation to something quite different. And so, and I think it's been, it's very interesting. We've gone through a parrot which has some of the more unusual aspects of temple service, not the Korbonus like you get in Zavochin so much, but the libations, the mechanical instruments, the construction of the Mizbeach, the shit in the pipes, and stuff like that, stuff which is a little bit more uh, esoteric. And we've seen some of this here in this parak. The next parak is Hecholil, and uh, we will start this Mishnah. The Cholil was actually mentioned in uh, the previous parak as one of the instruments used in the Simchat Beit HaShoeva. In the Simchat Beit HaShoeva, which is the drawing of water, of this libation water from the um, Shiluach pool, and taking it up the hill. Remember, it was accompanied with great instrumentation, with thousands of people. It was a procession. It was a tsa'ada. And in this tsa'ada, there were musicians. There were probably harpists and trumpeters, and there were flautists, F-L-A-U-T-I-S-T. And this, this peric starts off talking about the flutes. Yeah, so this is a musical peric, which I, I hope you will enjoy for that reason. 
I'm not going to sing it, but let's 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 see what it offers us. The Mishnah actually said before, Hecholil Chamisha Vishisha. The Cholil, the flute was used sometimes five days and sometimes six days. Five and six means um, five or six days. And that's because it wasn't blown on Shabbos and it wasn't blown on Yom Tov. We'll see why. So, so on the, the day of Yom Tov, and if Shabbos was one of those meet weekdays, uh, one of the days of Cholamoed, then it would be blown. So sometimes it, there were two days of, out of seven that it wasn't used, sometimes just one, which was Yom Tov, because Shabbos was on Yom Tov, so only one day would actually be out of use for blowing. There is a problem with blowing the flute on Shabbos or any other musical instruments, and we'll come to that in a moment. But that's the reason that the flute was only in use either on five days or six days. And the Mishnah goes on to say, you know, the order is a bit strange in this Mishnah, this is referring to the flute of the Beis HaShoeva ceremony, because the flute was actually blown, blown on other ceremonies as well. So here, when it comes to the um, Beis HaShoeva ceremony, um, the flute was used in the musical accompaniment, um, and it would be either in place five days or six days, depending upon when Shabbos would fall. She'eno docha no, so Shabbos for no es because it does not push away neither Shabbos or Yom Tov. That's the end of the Mishnah, just to explain that to you. In other words, when it comes to Shabbos, or Yom Tov, they didn't use the flute, and they didn't use other instruments either. There's a few questions over here. One is, what, what, first of all, what is the flute used for? It's to create an atmosphere of joy, of gladness, and of simcha. Like you, you would use any musical instrument. Why are we mentioning the flute? Other instruments were also used. So the uh, Aharonim tend to say that it seems the flute might have been the most prominent of the musical instruments used at the time. But this would go for other instruments as well. If trumpeters were there, then it would be the same. You would have it five or six days because it wouldn't be taken with Shabbos and Yom Tov. So we're not specifically referring to the flute, but any musical instrument would be <clears throat> included in this terminology, hecholim. And it's not docha, either Shabbos or Yom Tov, which means you can't blow it on Shabbos or on Yom Tov. Now, to us, that seems quite reasonable. We have the same problem, we have the same thing actually, uh, a little bit the same thing on Rosh Hashanah. Where Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbos, we don't blow the shofar. We do on Yom Tov, that's because the Torah says you blow on Yom Tov, you can't get away with it. But if it's Shabbos and it's two days, if they, we, we don't blow on the Shabbos. Again, because you might come and carry the shofar to, to learn how to use it or to fix it or whatever it is through the streets and you shouldn't do so. So we have, um, uh, certainly Preston for not using musical instruments. What's the problem with, with blowing this in the, uh, this ceremony over here? What kind of Issa is involved? So the Issa of using, uh, the prohibition of using a musical instrument on Shabbos is taken to be that of, um, if the instrument breaks, that you might come to repair it. And that's actually true of a number of things that we're not supposed to use on Shabbos, even though there isn't a direct reason to know why not. Nowhere amongst the 39 Avmalochas will you find one against blowing a trumpet. There's simply not one there. It's a rabbinical decree, um, which says, like Mokta and many other rabbinical decrees, um, uh, which is there as a precaution, because if there's something wrong with your chauffeur, what you might come and do and plug it, you might decide, well, you know, I have better put some, some lead in it to try and uh, uh, cover the hole, or you may try to gloss it. If it's a, a flute, a hole may have been broken, you may want to uh, reform it or to, to seal one and open another position. Why would one do that if it's Shabbos? Simply because you're enwrapped in your music. Anything which you can become wrapped up in uh, could lead possibly to overstepping the mark. So it's a gazera. It's there to prevent you overstepping the mark and doing something you can't do. If you repair it, then that could be an ism in our Torah. So therefore, Hazal said you shouldn't even um, use a musical instrument lest you might come to repair it. So that's the reason you're not supposed to use a musical instrument. The Tosas here brings up a question, which is, which is something that appears Elsewhere, when we talk about the ceremonial of the base of Mikdash, there's a rule that ancient Bamikdosh, 
that there are no rabbinical prohibitions on a Shabbos or Yom Tov, which are in effect in the Beis HaMikdash. Um, if you need to do something for a, an Avodah, for a temple service, then all um, uh, prohibitions which are rabbinic are put aside. They're put aside. And therefore, they used to do more things that we wouldn't do. For example, staff that was muktzah, they used to count for us, would be muktzah, would not be muktzah for the Kohanim in the Beis HaMikdash, because they would need it for a particular ceremonial. And so they'd be allowed to do a lot of things that we wouldn't be allowed to do. Um, they have a broader range of tolerance. Those gezerot are not in effect in the Beis HaMikdash. That's a klal, it's a general overriding rule. So therefore, the question is asked, why can't you use the flute? Why couldn't you use musical instruments? That's, I said to you, it was only a gzeira drabonon to prevent you repairing it. But, but the decree is a rabbinic decree. Why shouldn't you allow people to use it? And particularly, if, you, if, if we is aware of the rationale that they, um, uh, that they did away with rabbinic decrees in the base. I mean, it's, the reason for this was not just because it was being used for a sacred purpose, and therefore you might think, well, you know, why have rabbinic decrees get into the way of the temple service? But there's another reason, and that is because there was another rule that said, but Kohanim is a reason, hey, you can trust Kohanim. Kohanim are very anxious to make sure all the duties are in place. If you're a Kohen in the base of Migdash, you're not Mr. Joe Blogs out in the street somewhere with your mind up, uh, in, you know, uh, with your head in the clouds. You're literally aware of everything you're doing. You have a kavana. So surely a Kohen does not need rabbinic prohibitions to, to prevent him from overstepping the mark. That's the reason they had this rule, Ainshus Mikdash, that they could um, transgress, so to speak, rabbinic prohibitions. They're not being made for Kohanim, because Kohanim don't need pro rabbinic prohibitions to keep them away from transgressing Torah prohibitions. That's why you can, uh, the Kohanim were allowed to do these things. Why weren't they then allowed to blow the, uh, the flute and play other instruments as well? Are you afraid that they might come to repair them? Which I said they're not. These are Kohanim. Kohanim know Olivian. They know that they shouldn't repair. And in and, and that case, why implement this prohibition on, on Shabbos and Yot? That's the question that Tosis asks. And he, his answer is interesting. He comes up with an answer, which is that the Rationale for using musical instruments in the Simcha space Hashueva was not because it was, it was part and parcel per se of the Avoda of the, of the base Hashueva, of the Nisoch HaMayim, the libation ceremony. It wasn't a component of the ceremony, Tosa says. It was just something put in place to add what he calls Simcha Yaseira, to increase the joy and the gladness and the, and the happiness of this ceremony. In other words, it was an, an um, I would say to you, an enabler. One should be the simcha. It's called simcha space, I show over. But I don't need music to be the simcha. I mean, I decide when I get up in the morning, I hear the birds singing, etc. It's a beautiful sunny day, and it's I'm down in the Shaluach pool. I'm walking up the hill. I can see all the Kohanim in their splendor. And I see the base on Mikdosh standing beautifully at the top of the hill. I'm the simcha. And I'm, I'm the kai in the simple space I show over just on this. However, there are some miserable people around in the world. So uh, the rabbi said, why not have some flutes and some you know, instruments and pianos and accordions, et cetera, et cetera, in order to foster the atmosphere of simcha. So because it's not a necessary implement of the avoda, but only enabling a simcha, it didn't come into the category of those things that they allowed people to do, those rabbinic prohibitions they allowed you to break. Somehow, if you like, the, um, the, 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 the waiver given to Kohanim that they could break um, uh, prohibitions that were rabbinic is restricted to those tasks which are required as part and parcel of the temple ceremony itself. And the additional joy element injected by the in instruments that are in use are not part and parcel of the temple ceremony. They're merely trying to enable and to enhance the level of joy and to promote an, an atmosphere of simcha. But that could be there without them as well. 
and that and therefore this did not allow them to offer a waiver. For this reason, on a Shabbat and a Yom Tov, the um, uh, flutes and other instruments were not in use. Um, and on Yom Tov in particular, uh, because on Yom Tov they brought things up from the pool and they accompanied the also the libation. Um, uh, there was always a nice atmosphere there as well. So why why use flutes? You can get away with it. You can create simcha even without it. it wasn't a necessary component. We'll stop over here. Um, we finished exactly the end of the omelet, but we started the Mishnah next week. Please God, we'll start the Gemara on Hecholil, and we're going to get into uh, the atmosphere of the Beis Hamikdash with um, blowing trumpets and flutes and stuff like this. This is for those choir masters, etc. might get something out of this period. So thank you for joining me. Let me just uh, prevent.